I'm Naisha McCauley, and you're watching AccessTV.org. Welcome to AccessTV.org. Jonathan Small's next live with All About You. Stay tuned. Again, this is Jonathan Small, host of All About You. Today is July the 15th, 2013. We broadcast this program live every Monday at AccessTV.org studios in downtown Hartford. And this program is designed to give my guests a chance to give his or her life story. Most times I will get into a particular topic or issue. Today I have a guest that was on my program uh, back in November, uh, November the 5th, and he pretty much gave his life story. But we're going to get into a real particular topic. Uh, he has a title that's classified as the Acting Executive Director of the Minority Construction Council. My guest this morning is Rufus Wells. Good morning, Rufus. Good How morning, you doing? John. Fine, thanks. Uh, okay. It's glad to have you back here, and I'm glad you can get into this particular issue or topic that we're going to get into this morning. Can you just kind of let people know where you are at right now, uh, physically, with your life? Uh, right now, um, I'm the acting uh, executive director of the Minority Construction Council, which is, as you mentioned, and um, what we try to do is improve uh, the uh, standing of minority contractors uh, in terms of their ability to get work on various, you know, federal, state, and local construction projects. Mm -hmm. um, I'm living in Florida, I tra in Georgia, excuse me, I travel back and forth. Uh, but, you know, I kind of see the, uh, the same issues. It's a, it's a national phenomenon. It's not really isolated to the state of Connecticut, although, you know, I'm more familiar with the, some of the local issues here in the state of Connecticut. What are some of the biggest problems that minority contractors are having throughout the country, in your opinion? Um, I would say uh, access to financing and access to bonding. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's really a catch-22 in terms of you can't get uh, you know bonding without financing, and you can't get financing without bonding mm -hmm. in terms of construction contracts. Um, these are you know, barriers to uh, entry into the uh, local and state and federal uh, construction arenas uh, because most uh, government contracts require uh, over a certain threshold that you have bonding and that threshold will vary uh, depending on, you know, whether it is state, federal, or, or, or local. Mm -hmm. Is some of the fault uh, on the minority contractors themselves, or is the blame kind of spread all across the board? I think it's you know systemic. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in terms of that, I think it's the system that's uh, it, kind of set up to block minority contractors uh, because you know when you bid on these contracts, you need a bid bond. Uh, you you actually also you need like a work history or record, okay, a resume mm -hmm. if, if in uh, an employment sense. To say that you've worked on jobs and uh, a bonding company will look uh, at uh, a construction contractor's net worth and give him a bonding line of credit uh, based on um, his net worth, he, a, a multiple of his net worth, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, financing, um, yeah, you know, I was in banking, and uh, you know, I think that the financing is um, banking goes against minorities. Let me put it that way. It's mm -hmm. a it's a tiered system, mm -hmm. and uh, African American uh, contractors are probably on it, it, on the bottom tier. Mm -hmm. Well, is it important that we separate the difference when you say minorities for African American, Latinos, Asians, and Indians, and other uh, races that are classified as uh, minorities? I think it is, uh, you know, from the perspective of uh, the uh, 1989 Crozen decision, mm -hmm. uh, because cities and states uh, used to have set aside programs uh, recognizing the effects of 
uh, past discrimination mm -hmm. on a ethnic group's ability uh, to be able to secure work. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happened was the set-aside programs were challenged. Mm -hmm. And what the Supreme Court uh, said, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court said, was that uh, you have to prove that the particular ethnic group has been harmed, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, or discriminated against. And once you prove discrimination, then you can uh, narrowly tailor a program, not for Hispanics and Asians and African Americans and women business enterprises, but if only African Americans were uh, injured or discriminated against, then you can have a remedy that addresses African Americans. If it's Hispanics that have been discriminated against, then you can have a set-aside program just for Hispanics. If it's Asians, so on and so forth, and Native mm -hmm. Americans, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so it is important not to throw everybody into this bucket called uh, minority, mm -hmm. because really what it does is it distorts uh, the actual discrimination that's taking place. Mm -hmm. Well, Rufus, this kind of goal is not just in construction as problems of getting access to capital and bonding, but it gets into many other sectors of our economic structure that exist in this country. Um, is construction one of the most important parts of the economic uh, structure that minorities are or blacks are yeah. having? I, I, you know, um, you're, you're right when you say that uh, it's not just construction. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's uh, goods and services, it's uh, professional services like architects and engineers and accountants. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's kind of across the board, but it's, it's ethnic, mm -hmm. it's racial, okay, mm -hmm. uh, is the problem. Um, I know when I was in banking uh, back in the uh, 1970s when, where I started out, um, I wrote mortgages and um, I saw um, how African Americans were treated, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, non-African Americans or whites, if you will. And, um, you know, you could have the same credit profile, but, uh, you know, African Americans, you know, had to have a little heavier down payment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the relationships, the banking relationships weren't there. And, um, you know, I, it's... Um, it's just a system to set up. I mean, I, I got to call it what it is. It's a system of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what happened was, you know, back in the 1860s when they had the Emancipation Pro uh, Proclamation, they took the chains off black folks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they took them off their legs and off their hands, but they didn't take the chains off their minds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and, and you're right. Uh, about it not just being construction because I was reading an article over the weekend that said they were getting ready to cut back on uh, food stamps, mm -hmm. okay? And I think there's like uh, 50 million Americans on food stamps now. Mm -hmm. But the picture at the head of the caption had two black women sitting at the table. Yes. You know, so it's very subtle seed planting is done that, you know, uh, food stamp program is, is, a, is a black African-American program. That's mm -hmm. not true. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there's 50 million people on food stamps, okay, and there's 30 million African Americans in the whole United States, 30 yeah. million plus, mm -hmm. you know, does that mean that all of us are on food stamps? Every single last African American. <laughs> right. You see what I'm saying? So it's subtle things that are done to reinforce that stereotype that, you know, uh, blacks don't want to work. Uh, they produce an inferior product, uh, you know, you get into the corporate environment, it's, there's a glass ceiling, it's higher for them to, uh, you know, progress. So, um, yeah, it's not just construction, but, you know, right now I'm dealing with construction and I see these issues as they're applied to the construction industry. Well, wasn't there some type of law, I don't know if it was the Davis-Baker Act, that was passed that kind of relates to some of these problems and issues that we're talking about? Well, Davis Bacon is like a wage an hour, and that deals with more pay uh, on uh, federal jobs. Oh, okay. 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 So um, I think what that made sure was that there was uh, equal pay for the work that was being done. Okay. Okay. Uh, by work classification. Um, and, you know, employment is just as important as, as contracting, yes. as, as we uh, you know spoken earlier. Uh, there's a very high 
uh, unemployment rate uh, within the black uh, community, and I would extend that to a lot of Hispanic communities also, uh, because if our contractors aren't working, yes, uh, you know, black contractors hire black people, mm -hmm. Hispanic contracts hire Hispanics, white contractors hire white. I mean, it's a cultural thing. I'm not saying that it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, <laughs> if black contractors aren't getting work, yes, then the you know uh, black workers aren't working. Well, let me say, Rufus, in your own business, you can pretty much hire whoever you want as long as you're not discriminating against race, uh, age, or sex. So if you have your own business, mm -hmm. you can decide if I want to hire somebody that I want to hire. If that person looks like me, you can get away with it. But it's when you get into a public agencies like the water and sewage the, or utility companies right. that I have an issue that there's nepotism and favoritism exist in those arenas. And is that a serious problem, too, that's contributing to a high unemployment for African-Americans and Latinos? Very serious. Uh, you know, I, I've been concentrating, you know, on, on the MDC these past, uh, you know, six, seven years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people think that I got an axe to grind with the MDC, and I, I do. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> I do have an axe to grind with them, but they're not the only bad player. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you, you've got the, you know, Connecticut Resource Recovery uh, CRRA. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know that the last time Chairman DeBella was on, he was talking, comparing himself to the state. The state of Connecticut is not does not have a stellar record yes. in terms of, you know, hiring and contracting, uh, you know, with minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, ma matter of fact, they're in the process of doing a disparity study now. Um, and, you know, there's an old biblical saying that, you know, well, well people, people that uh, have no health issues mm -hmm. don't need a physician. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, the state of Connecticut needs a physician. Yes. So th that's kind of saying that uh, you don't test for discrimination if there's not a hint that it exists. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So that hint existed at the MDC. That hint exists at the state of Connecticut. That hint exists at the uh, light, the electric light company. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, so all these different utilities, I'm, and, uh, and I'm not saying that they're all in the same, uh, you know, classification, I'm saying that there's issues at each one of these uh, various institutions. Well, Rufus, we talked off of the air a couple of days ago that you live in Georgia mm -hmm. and you travel throughout the South and North, and you said that you see a lot more black people working on infrastructure, particularly highway construction, oh, than yeah. you do up here in the North. I felt maybe it's because the wages are a lot different, but those are right to work states where the wages are a lot lower. Do you think it's more to it than just the wages why you might see more African American working on certain construction projects in the South? Uh, yeah, I, I, I really do. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of the southern states, uh, and, and we used to think of them as, you know, slave states, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, southern states, they, um, they, they get it. Mm -hmm. They get that uh, the more people that are working in their population, paying taxes, the more vibrant their state. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. You start to move into the Northeast, and, and you run into a situation where uh, you know unions are very strong, and uh, you know there's a lot of unions. I don't think that are you know good friends of uh, black people. Mm -hmm. Okay, because um, uh, and, and I throw this out as a challenge to the unions. If you take you know a black worker and a white worker uh, with similar time. Uh, in their trade, mm -hmm. okay, and you compare the hours worked by a black worker and the hours worked by a, a white worker, I think that you'll see that the white workers' hours are substantially higher uh, than the black workers, mm -hmm. okay. And I don't think that it really uh, goes to uh, the quality of the employee mm -hmm. to say that this is a better employee than, than, than that employee. Mm -hmm. And the union has a lot of rules that um, are definitely um, you know, not in the best interest of uh, minority workers, particularly blacks. 
So Rufus, the unions would be a major obstacle if you're trying to enter certain fields of the utilities, the water and sewage agencies, the gas agencies, particularly in the north or states that have strong unions, regulations, um, more than other factors, or there's other factors like that the human resource department plays into this problem too? Well, let's see, again, when, when I talk about structural, you know, you got to get past the union acid test to even work. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> once you get accepted in the union and get a book to work, mm -hmm. okay, then you can be discriminated against on the job. Okay. But if you can't even get to the job, then you don't have to worry about discrimination. You know what I mean? I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there that are unemployed uh, that would, you know, love to be in a situation where they're being discriminated against on the job in terms of, uh, you know, rate of pay, hours of work you know, a lot of those other issues that uh, the union is supposed to level the playing field for, mm -hmm. um, but they don't even get a, they don't even get a call. You know, I get, get a lot of union trades people uh, telling me that, you know, they're a member of the union, but they, they can't get work. Mm -hmm. And the reason they can't get work is because if they have this thing called the bench and uh, <laughs> you get called in off the bench, mm -hmm. the number never gets called. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the dues paying members. Okay, so you tell me if it's discrimination or not. Uh, we need to look at. I don't think we need to give anybody a pass, particularly uh, the unions, mm -hmm. because the union unions have been pushing this concept called project labor agreement. Um, and we have it here in Hartford in the, on the uh, on the schools. Uh, uh, the state of Connecticut has it on the uh, Capital Region Education Council schools that are being built. The PLA is not a friend to uh, black contractors and black employees, mm -hmm. okay? So um, the project labor agreement says that you have to join the union for that particular job. Mm -hmm. Even if you're an open shop or a non-union contractor, you know, you agree to uh, uh, abide by all the union tenants, pay union benefits and things of that nature for that particular job, mm -hmm. okay? What that tends to do is drive up the cost of the job, okay? Uh, but the other thing that it tends to do is, you know, deal black um, contractors and black workers out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Well, Rufus, if you are having a difficult time and you're in the union getting access to jobs and employment, it makes it seem like it's almost impossible if you're on the outside seeking a job and you're not even in the union. You're telling me people that's already in the unions that are black are having a very difficult time getting called up for the jobs. What does that say for people that's not even in the unions having a time? Therein the lies the rub. Um, I've had uh, several people that are uh, members of the Minority Construction Council start their own business mm -hmm. just, just to be able to work. Okay. Okay. Uh, because they're saying, look, I'm sitting on the bench. I'm not getting the hours. I'd be better off starting my own business, bidding on some of these jobs, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, rolling the dice as to whether or not I can work or not. You know, mm -hmm. they know that if they stay on the bench, they're not going to be able to work, mm -hmm. okay. But, uh, you know, like the Harper uh, School Building uh, Program uh, Project Labor Agreement mm -hmm. specifies 5% union um, minority contractors, mm -hmm. okay. So... It, they get two bites at the apple. They could either go after the non-union piece or the, the union piece of the uh, uh, minority set aside for the uh, Harper School Building Group. Mm -hmm. Well, would you say, Rufus, that there's at times maybe just not enough work or jobs to go around to offer to everybody that needs employment? Or is it just the fact that certain um, power structures would rather keep any particular job structure for their own people and then if there's anything left out, you might get called. Is it a little bit more complicated than just that? Well, I think that, you know, when the United States uh, sneezes, black people already have, you know, like uh, the swine flu, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> if right. you will, okay? Right. Because uh, we're the last hired, first fired. I mean, that's always been uh, the situation, mm -hmm. okay? So when times are good, yeah, there's a little extra uh, to go around and, you know, they, they'll um, be a little more inclusive uh, when the uh, economy
economy is humming along as opposed to when there's an economic contraction like there's been for the last, I don't know, six years mm -hmm. uh, for majority firms. I, I would uh, throw out there that it's been this way for the last 12 years since probably around 99, 2000 for black firms. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, but, you know, I guess the, the, the long and the sh short answer is that, you know, black firms are catching hell regardless of whether it's good times or bad times. Yes. Okay. Well, that sounds like that's systemic and structural when you can it be is. catching hell whether it's good times or, or bad times. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Because it would be easy to say, well, if nobody is not working or getting any benefit, then that's, you know, reasonable to understand why you can't get any resource or any opportunity. But if you see development, now I don't know what it's like down in Georgia where you reside, but we have a big clean water project that's been going here in the greater Hartford area, probably throughout the state over the past seven years. And there's a lot of development uh, projects going on all over the uh, greater Hartford area, but right. yet African Americans and Latinos who live in certain urban sectors where the actual work is taking place find themselves on the outside looking in. Uh, why is that still uh, existing? I think that that is, and, and, and to be specific, I think that that is the culture uh, of the MDC uh, and the Metropolitan District Commission of Water Company. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, what they stated over time is that they don't discriminate. Okay. okay. But if you look at their history, and I'm not even talking just uh, recent history since uh, this clean water project started, um, there was a young lady that, uh, you know, sued the MDC uh, back around 2000 or so and uh, was awarded a million and a half, I guess initially $4.65 million mm -hmm. in damages because of the discrimination. And there's been a number of internal uh, employee lawsuits against the MDC mm -hmm. uh, because of discrimination. But yet and still, you know, Chairman DeBellow can sit here and tell us, well, we don't discriminate, we've got a great history. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a difference between saying you have a great history and actually examining that history that you boast of. Yes. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people can say, oh, I'm a superstar, but, you know, you don't determine whether someone's a, a, a athletic superstar by what they say is by their performance. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the MDC. I'd rather not listen to what they say, and I'd rather, you know, uh, look at their performance, and their performance has been poor over time. Mm. Performance meaning hiring African Americans and other minorities, or just performance on discrimination, or what? what? Across the board. Across the whole board? I mean, across the board. Uh, they, they have people that work in the MDC that are African American, and they're scared to death for their jobs on a daily basis, mm -hmm. okay, because of the culture. Uh, of the MDC. And now, mind you, the MDC is a quasi-public uh, organization, mm -hmm. which means that, you know, they're, uh, they're like an agency. Uh, they, they are uh, government in one sense, but they're private in a sense also. Mm -hmm. Okay, they've been spiked out from the regular government. Okay. Okay, like an authority. Mm -hmm. Okay, they're like the water authority kind of like in housing, you have like a housing authority and mm -hmm. you have an economic development authority. They're the water authority. Okay. Okay. So they're supposed to serve the public. They use the public money. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is supposed to be done even handedly. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you look at the uh, profile of the management uh, in the MDC, mm -hmm. you, there's a deficit of uh, African American or black participation in their management levels. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm not saying that they don't have any, but uh, they have very few, and they're isolated in non-operational uh, categories. They, mm -hmm. they couldn't come to the community and tell you what the financial performance of the MDC is, mm -hmm. or uh, you know the you know personnel you know profiles and things of that nature. They put them off to the side in, in, in areas where uh, they can't upset the apple cart, if you will, mm -hmm. in terms of divulging information to the public that uh, might give the MDC a black eye. Well, if the MDC is a public agency, why would they be afraid of even, you know, receiving a black eye for doing the wrong thing? If you're doing the wrong thing, the right thing to do is to correct it. Okay. 
Oh, you, you, yeah, yeah, you that's the common saying? thread yeah. that you would correct your father right. if you're doing something wrong. Absolutely. Uh, but, I mean, they, they, they uh, continue to do the wrong thing and uh, say that they're doing the right thing. Okay, and then you have lawsuits that indicate that they're doing the wrong thing. You have disparity studies uh, that are completed that indicate that they're doing the wrong thing. And whenever they're doing the wrong thing, you can bet that they're going to spin the situation. Oh, no, we're, you know, our history, our, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, um, it's um, it's a shame. Well, Rubens, excuse me, I know you're very passionate about this NBC and this Clean Water Project, yes. even though you don't live up here. I mean, I guess you travel um, back and back forth, and forth. Okay, so, yeah. so you're very unfamiliar with what's oh, going yeah. on. Absolutely. Um, I would look at it a little bit beyond just the NBC. I would look at it utilities, gas companies, um, cable companies. But I think the problem, Rufus, why you might see African Americans having a difficult time getting employment is that the wages are very good. I know many African Americans that work in janitorial security firms. They just, you know, are janitorial workers, security workers make very low pay, but I can see a lot of African Americans getting employment in those arenas. Mm -hmm. When it comes time for utilities and gas and water companies where the wages are a lot higher, I see that's where you have the big imbalance. So does wages really and benefits have a lot to do with why blacks are having a difficult time getting into these uh, industries? No, because I think you could look at, uh, I think you could look at education also, okay. not to, you know, throw a curveball in there, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, teachers in Connecticut, Harper in particular, paid very highly. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, engineers, accountants, we talked about that uh, uh, earlier. Um, and I think that, you know, blacks are competitive. We have black students or, you know, black folks that live in Harper, they go to college, uh, they drum up a huge college bill because mm -hmm. education is supposed to be uh, the way out of uh, a, a poverty mm -hmm. that has not translated for, for many uh, African Americans. I would also uh, extend that to a lot of, uh, you know, um, white um, population. Mm -hmm. Okay, the education nowadays, man, when you got to plop down, you know, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars or more for an education and you come out and you can't get a job, part of that is due to the economy. Okay. Okay. But uh, I think that there's a disproportionate amount of African Americans that are not working. Okay. When they come back to Hartford where they grew up, they can't even get a job in a, in a school system that they attended. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, assist the young folks uh, with getting a perspective uh, on education, on life, uh, a lot of teachers that they're hiring in the Harper school system, they they don't have a there's there's a cultural uh, deficit. I don't think that a lot of the teachers really understand the kids that they're supposed to be teaching. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't think that the teachers can relate to the parents mm -hmm. because I don't think that you know uh, education is a a one sided thing where it's all the teacher. Or it's all the parents. It's a combination. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you take that education and you get someone going through the education system, coming out the other end. Now they apply to an MDC, a CLMP, a mm -hmm. state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, you know when they get turned away because they didn't have a relationship, so so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, Many things in, in our culture are done based on who you know. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's when I say relationship. Uh, their parents didn't have the relationships. Um, there's no banking relationships. Remember we talked very early yes. on about banking relationships. Mm -hmm. Well, if I've got a banking relationship, I pass that on to my son and my daughter. Yes. Okay, they pass that on to their son and their daughter. Mm -hmm. So this is our bank, if you will. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So when you come through and you want to start a company, your your family has a history uh, with that financial institution. And they go, oh, yeah, I know his dad. I know his uncle. Mm -hmm. You know, uncle may be in business. Dad may be in business. And they can sign off on them that, you know, if we've had a good experience here and we've had a good experience with the uncle, uh, 
give the son or the daughter mm -hmm. uh, the loan that uh, African American or Hispanic, I don't think that it's unique to African Americans in that regard, yeah. or Hispanic, if you don't have those relationships, you don't get the loan. Okay. Well, Rufus, you live in the metro Atlanta area, mm -hmm. and they're known for having a high black middle class population base. Um, do the black middle class in the metro Atlanta area reach out to the people that have not been able to benefit in this economic system? Uh, yes, they do. Um, and see, population counts, and I think that there's a there's an understanding of political power more so in Atlanta than there is in uh, Hartford. Okay. Um, you know when. Say you have a, a you know a Hispanic mayor like we have in Hartford, mm -hmm. and you know he starts hiring Hispanics. I'm not mad at him. Okay. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. I think that that's what he's supposed to do. Right. You know what I mean? If he's not going to do it, who's going to do it? Yes. Okay. On the other hand, when you have a you know a, a, a black or African American mayor uh, in the city of Hartford, somehow we feel like we've got to be not hire uh, African Americans for some reason. Mm -hmm. I don't get that mentality. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, because if we hire African Americans, we would be seen as discriminating against everybody else. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that African Americans have to eat all the apple. Yes. Okay. Nothing wrong with the first bite, though. Right. Just like I, I don't see anything wrong with uh, Hispanics getting the first bite if they've got. Uh, if you've got a Hispanic mayor, I don't see anything wrong mm -hmm. with Hispanics getting the first bite of the apple. Mm -hmm. Now, every bite, I got a problem with that. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm sure a lot of other people would too. But mm -hmm. first bite of the apple, I, you know, God bless him, and mm -hmm. he's doing what he's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, white mayor, you know, highest white site. I understand that. Mm -hmm. But I'm, um, I'm saying that to pass along the concept that this, it's. Uh, not a sin to take care of your own people. Okay. Okay. We got a president, and I don't really want to go there, but we got a president, and we're not getting any bites. Right. Okay. And I'm not saying that uh, he's not a good president. I'm not saying that he's not doing uh, what the president should do, but I feel that there's this, well, we can't help African Americans because it may be seen that, um, you know, he's uh, discriminating. For some reason, and I, I don't think so. You know, I mm. think that it's uh, duty bound upon him to help make the African American ships rise. You know, and to the extent that that doesn't happen, what's the benefit? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's not really taking a shot at, at the president. Uh, just taking a shot at the system mm -hmm. and and the demands that it places on him. Mm -hmm. Well, well, Rufus, if the president would say we need a black agenda, it wouldn't be politically correct for him to come out and say that. But if he say we need an urban agenda where a lot of African Americans and Hispanics reside at, that would be a little bit more safer ground for him to walk on? Well, I mean, you know, you, you, you can speak in code, you know what I mean, and say, well, you know, and we've always spoken code. And whenever we, you know, spoke in code, it gets interpreted like, you know, you say black, it gets interpreted as minority. Right. Okay, uh, which then turns around and flips and gets interpreted as uh, anybody but black. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and the um, as far as I can remember, blacks were the ones that were enslaved, that were working for free, mm -hmm. uh, that were supposed to get forty acres and a mule, that you know, yeah, okay. <laughs> all this other stuff that was supposed to happen for blacks. And here we are, I don't know, 150 years or so after. Uh, the, you know, the, the end of slavery, and we're still talking about a lot of the same issues that they talk about coming out of slavery. Uh, and I don't, I don't think that, you know, when you tell somebody, okay, you're free, that it ends there. Right. Uh, because if you start like a, a hundred uh, yard race and everybody else got a 90 yard head start on you, I think that, you know, you, you've got to close the gap. Mm -hmm. first and then say okay and, and that you, uh, you know it's equal and that's what set aside programs are supposed to accomplish but they uh, they don't because um, you know uh, the way that they're constructed 
um, blacks and Hispanics or whoever is in a set aside program uh, is limited in the amount of work that they can do, the amount of profit that's in the job, that, that whole nine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Well, Rufus, I think in some areas you can see progress just based on talent. And I'll tell you, if we look at the NBA, blacks make up the majority of the players. Uh, football, mostly blacks. Baseball, I think a lot of, of Latinos. Because I think you want the best talent on the floor. In certain areas that we're talking about construction, utility, you don't have to really be the best worker. You could be a less uh, qualified worker and still be able to do the job and not so much hurt the industry like the utilities or, or the gas companies. But in the NBA, you need the best player on the floor to give your team the chance of winning the championship. Is it more to it than, than, than the, just that? Rufus? Absolutely. Okay. You know. Like, uh, the best player isn't always on the floor. In basketball? In basketball. Oh, okay. <laughs> the best player is not on the floor. Okay. Let's say you and I are both guards in the NBA. Okay. And uh, let's say you have more talent than I have. Mm -hmm. But they're paying me $10 million a year. Okay. They're paying you 200000 Okay. Okay. Um, I would suggest... That I'm going to see more court time than you're going to see if I'm making, you know, ten million dollars and you make. I don't care how good you are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me, because what it does is it speaks to the uh, intelligence of the person that hired me and you. Mm -hmm. Is it what I'm saying? Okay. Man, why are we sitting ten million dollars on the bench? And this is between blacks. Mm -hmm. We're both black, right? Right. Why are we sitting ten million dollars on the bench and playing two hundred thousand? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> right. you, you see what I'm saying? So um, that that's saying that somebody is not doing their job if there's a pay in equity like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so in, very often you see more talented players uh, sitting on the bench uh, as opposed to uh, a player that went to a high profile institution. Okay. Everybody has name recognition, mm -hmm. you know, so on and so forth. You know, so. Um, I would say that, the, you know, even though it's black, you know, or whatever it is, it, there's, there's an equity there also. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but probably you're a little bit more happy if you're just on the team. At least you're not uh, excluded from the, the team. If you're, if you're only making 200000 and you're not playing much it, uh, basketball time, I mean, you're not happy no. totally, but you can live with it if you got a job. Um, but you know what, A athletics, I just think, you know, um, man, the, the, the money that's in athletics, and then if you look at the, you know, the money that's in, uh, you know, private industry, mm -hmm. I mean, it, take an MBA, the MBA as an institution, and there may be 500 right. blacks, you know what I mean, and you take, uh, you know, education, or you take, uh, you know, information technology or, or, or engineering or other different fields mm -hmm. where there's, you know, hundreds of thousands of, you know, black professionals mm -hmm. uh, out there. Uh, the focus, okay, is on the MBA. Right. These elite 500 people that are making millions of dollars a year. Uh, and, and that's not to take away from their effort because they're good at what they do. Yes. Now, if they're, you know, worth $10 million to play basketball. It, it wasn't like that, you know, back in the day, but um, mm -hmm. it's 10, 10 million is 10 million. Right. You have very intellectually uh, astute people in other areas that, um, you know, they're, they're not making anywhere uh, near that or unemployed. Yes. Okay. They're all dressed up and no place to go. Is but, that right? Well, well, well. See, that's a real sad <laughs> reality when you pursue education, because you you constantly tell people you need to get educated and trained, and then when you get the education and training, you're having a difficult time getting gainfully employed. There's also another side that many of our residents or our societies throughout our country is not even finishing high school. They they're having a difficult time barely getting through high school. Their job prospects are are bleak, and 
sometimes we don't even look at those people. We focus so much, and I'm not saying we did, we're doing this unintentionally on, on today's show, mm -hmm. but you have a lot of people who just barely graduate high school who have a difficult time figuring out which direction to go into, and I think we are ignoring that population base too, Rufus. Well, I mean, you know, this is not a trick question, but, you know, what is an education? Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, to be honest with uh -huh. you, what is an education? Uh -huh. These guys that are making $10 million, you know, or $5 million or a million or whatever, playing baseball or basketball or football, um, they didn't learn that uh, athletic ex excellence in uh, college. Mm -hmm. uh, what college did was it put them on the stage to be able to show the world yes. uh, that they were, you know, premier uh, athletes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I would suggest that there's a lot of uh, people in our inner cities mm -hmm. that uh, they fail at the traditional education level. It used to be that they had the apprentice system. You know, they teach you to read, write, uh, uh, and count. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And then uh, you'd be somebody's apprentice to either make cabinets or... Uh, blacksmith or whatever, but you work. You actually worked mm -hmm. uh, in the field. Even uh, lawyers, right? Okay, uh, they apprenticed under another lawyer way back before they had the uh, uh, university system. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and they honed their skill as they went along in life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you learn by doing. Right. Now, um, why do you know kids have to be in in a classroom you know five or six and some people are trying to say they need to be in the eight hours a day you know uh, 12 months a year kind of like a job and e there's even some people that are suggesting the students need to be paid to learn mm. um after you reach a certain age you know in my opinion you're able to teach yourself right okay, that's true. That's true. <laughs> okay so now what we're doing is we're warehousing people okay mm -hmm. uh and then we put this concept uh, into the American lexicon that you, you have to have a bachelor's degree, uh -huh. okay? And now uh, you have to have a master's degree, you uh -huh. know, to really, you know, because there's so many bachelor's degrees out there now, uh, in order to separate yourself from the herd, you need a leg up. So right. you need a master's, master's degree, yes. okay? Uh -huh. uh, and then some people even to get a further leg up go after a PhD. But I, I mean, what is the purpose of education uh, is like my question, and I put that question to a lot of people. Uh, and you know, education is big business. Mm -hmm. this, this face is well, not well, not only education, but social service, criminal justice systems. These are all big businesses too. And if you have a lot of people that fall into the criminal justice system areas, the social service areas, it keeps a lot of people employed. It keeps a lot of money flowing into those areas, and Unfortunately, a lot of people that's in the criminal justice system and the social service systems, they're not ever going to reach their full potential. Well, I, I would suggest that a lot of people are in the criminal justice system because they can't find employment. Yes. Okay. And what they do is they, they, build, they build jails or you know, prisons based on the number of people that uh, graduate you know, from high school or mm -hmm. don't graduate from high school because mm -hmm. they know if you don't graduate from high school, how are you going to feed yourself? Yes. You got to do something that ain't exactly right. Right. That's true. That's true. <laughs> okay. And so they go, at some point in time, this person is going to fall out of the regular system, mm -hmm. and they're going to fall into the criminal justice system. And unfortunately, you know, our people are present in the criminal just, uh, justice system in a disproportionate amount. Yes. Okay. And I would... You know, say that it's because institutional racism. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's institutional racism. So our people are really, uh, you know, counted uh, to make money for somebody else because the prison yes. are being privatized. A privatized, yes. It's, it's a devastating <laughs> okay. trap to get out to. That's exactly what they call it—a trap. You mm -hmm. know, yes. <laughs> and people don't realize that it's a trap. The other thing that they don't realize is when minority contractors and minority businesses in general particularly black businesses, when they don't get business, um, it, um, what they're really uh, doing is they're um, attacking 
that whole segment of the population because that's economic warfare. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about this economic warfare because if people are not working, they have to do something right in order to support themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I would say that that is a failure of the system mm -hmm. uh, to you know provide opportunities for people to, to do things. People want to work. Yes, they want to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you look at the criminal, he's doing something. He's doing something. Just he's doing... working for himself. He's right. not doing what the normal society would consider productive. Mm -hmm. It's productive for him. It's counterproductive for the the greater society. Okay, and the thing that really, you know, breaks my heart is the, you know, the black on black crime mm -hmm. uh, that occurs uh, on account of the um, the injustice in the system. Well, it was just since you've been up here, you said you came back up here last week here in mm -hmm. the greater Hartford area. We had two homicides, and it really drew no, and it happened actually in the broad daytime. Two 25-year-old men were shot and killed. Right. One very near a, a, a elementary school. Right. But I'm saying I think our leadership, uh, and this blame for everybody, I guess even myself can look in the mirror and say we need to be doing more. Um how could you feel like you're really growing when so many of our black men are being shot and killed on a daily basis? I don't know if you pay attention on the national oh, level I, in Chicago. I do. It's a um, it's an epidemic problem. Yeah. yeah. And I think work and employment is a major solution, but yes. you got to look at your drug factors, your, your drug policies. You know how much of these drugs are coming into these areas, what it's doing to get people to feel like. And I know you have to eat at, at times, but selling drugs. Is bringing you into a criminal side where you got to defend your turf. I unfortunately think we might let this situation have gotten out of control, but do you think it's something that can be fixed the, the way that we're going? It, it could be fixed overnight if they wanted to fix it. Okay. Okay. Uh, we live in a surveillance society. Okay. Okay. Uh, we got eyes, electric electronic eyes in space, on corners, on traffic lights, on mm -hmm. the corner of houses. Uh, you know, when people put up surveillance uh, cameras at their front doors, anybody can tap into those, you know, if they're connected online. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, to think that the guys that are doing the killing, they're not bringing the drugs into the country. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So um, I'd say that if the United States wanted to, they could cut off you know, that aspect, the supply of drugs overnight, if they had a political will to do that. Mm -hmm. But I would, uh, from the things that I've read, our economy would implode if mm. they shut the drugs off. Shut the you drugs off, I mean? oh, yeah. Because now these guys that are outside the system uh -huh. that are, you know, uh, feeding their families and feeding others and this, uh, you know, underground system, uh, you know, of the economy is really... Put money in, they, they put money in the banks, mm -hmm. and the banks accept it. They're not supposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, okay. So, uh, you know, that's another whole topic for another time. But, uh, I mean, if you really examine, you know, this country and things that go on and in in the inequity and things that are allowed to happen and not allowed to happen, mm -hmm. um, I think that it's uh, there's a plan in place to uh, that, that lets those things happen. Mm -hmm. Well, you said the political will is, is really not there, and the whole economic system of this country would pretty much collapse. But I think if you come up with a legitimate plan to replace this um, drug profit margin that exists, uh, and there has to be a way that you can find ways to f keep your country economically and fiscally strong if you design something. Um, but is this a complicated problem that you think? Or just people something? are, people are and, I, and I don't know that things that, that happen nowadays couldn't happen back in the 60s, okay. probably the early 70s. And I, I don't know how it's been accomplished, but our population, particularly black people, seem mm -hmm. to be asleep. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, I take this, uh, you know, Trayvon Martin thing, and I hate the it up, but it kept me up over the weekend. I, mm. I couldn't sleep. Uh, and, and again, that's that system of uh, you know white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And um, you know things are allowed in this country, and, and we're fed by the media that that it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's not okay with me. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you know okay. what I mean? And I know that there's a lot of other people that it's that it's not okay with, mm-hmm. but that's the part of the system. You have somebody like a, a secretary of defense, like a, a, a Bronx girl that um, reported several years back. There's two billion dollars you know, that went to uh, uh, Iraq. Mm-hmm. We don't know where it is. Oh, okay. Nobody says anything. Mm-hmm. Two billion dollars. <laughs> you, yeah. you see what I'm saying? You know how many people could be housed with two billion dollars? Uh-huh. You know how many people could be fed with two billion dollars? Yes. We lost it. Mm-hmm. How do you lose two billion dollars? Okay, that's why I'm saying something wrong. Mm-hmm. Nobody questions. Nobody asks. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Bill DeBella says they're doing a great job. No, you know, nobody questions. Nobody asks. He says 77 percent of the voters voted for clean water. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm for clean water. Yes. I'm against corruption. Corruption, okay. okay. <laughs> you see what I'm uh, saying? I want to drink clean water. Mm-hmm. I want to see the sewer separation thing happen. Um, CRRA, they get a $10 million uh, fine that they're supposed to pay into the community because, uh, you know, this and this was back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, the stuff that they were doing over there with the methane gas was, you know, causing some kind of asthma. Uh, in the north end, because you know they put the dumps in the African American and Hispanic neighborhoods, mm-hmm. right? They never paid out on that, mm-hmm. and nobody ever asked any questions. Of course, it. yeah. Okay, but that's ten million dollars that could have been used as the impetus for economic development in in North Hartford mm-hmm. in the in the uh, African American community. Okay. Well, Ruth, I want to make sure that you get this point across because we talked a couple days ago that this huge clean water project is a $2 billion project. It's Mm -hmm. over a 15-year period. The project is almost halfway through. Mm -hmm. And the way that it's going, it looks like particularly the African Americans and uh, Hispanics is going to be totally shut out on any economic uh, gains on this project. How can that actually be allowed to happen, though? I mean, is that just something that was a plan from the beginning? It was. It, it was planned from the beginning. You know, people were telling me that, oh, you know, uh, that, that those contracts have been, uh, you know, divvied out before uh, the bond referendum is even approved. Oh. Okay. And, you know, I challenged the MDC leadership on this. Um, you know, they said, well, we're doing great. Uh, with minorities and women are minorities, and I'm saying no women are women. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, they have their own classification, W B E. Okay, yes. but for whatever reason, the state of Connecticut allows W B E's to also be M B E's. Mm-hmm. So they're able to get uh, 43 million dollars in prime construction contracts to W B E's. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, they don't have a problem with doing that. Of the 43 million, 42 million goes to one company, mm-hmm. but they can't find any black companies. Yes, none since the beginning of the project. Mm-hmm. They found one that they issued 284 thousand dollar contract to, and uh, a day after their report came out, they canceled that. So really, in essence, they had zero. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm taking this from information that they provided to me to say that we're doing great. Mm-hmm. Okay, and then there's uh, someone over there made the statement that a subcontract dollar was just as good as a prime contract dollar. Okay, give all the African Americans the prime contracts and we'll subcontract to those guys. Mm-hmm. You see, it, it's, you know, the difference between a prime contract dollar where you're uh, contracting directly with the agency, in this case the MDC, mm-hmm. is very different than a subcontract dollar where uh, now the subcontractor is going to the prime contractor Mm -hmm. for a contract. Now, the prime contractor is not going to let the subcontractor make more money than than him on his contract. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You Mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? And the level of risk, the further away from the agency you get, the level of risk is increased. Mm -hmm. So usually uh, black contractors, minority contractors are on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Okay, They're in the riskiest position because they have to come out of their pocket to meet their payroll every week. Okay. Okay. And a lot of these guys put their homes on the line uh, in order to leverage lines of credit to, you know, pay their payroll and, and things of that nature. And then they stretch out the payment period. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, normal business is 30 days. You know, every 30 days you get paid. Um, 
sometimes it's 60 days at the beginning of a contract to take into consideration the mobilization. The MDC, Harper School Building Program, I'm not letting them off the hook, mm -hmm. was taking, you know, 90, 120 days, you know. So these guys, are they put the money out and 120 days later, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they finally get paid. And somebody told me, well, um, it, we're still reviewing. This is one of the guys that was in the system. He said, well, we're still reviewing the requisition. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, how would you like to work? doing what you're doing and get paid every 120 days. Mm -hmm. I said, do you think there'd be a little different motivation then for you to move paperwork along? Mm -hmm. You Definitely. see, but the, if they get near paycheck every week and they're sitting on these contractors' pay, uh, paperwork, mm -hmm. and, and this hasn't just been unique to uh, minority contractors. It's just that if you're more fragile than a majority contractor because you don't have the relationships that I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. okay, pretty soon you tap your well dry and you're out of business, mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, you know, we're in a very fragile situation as minority contractors, and not just minority contractors, as minority or black business people, mm -hmm. okay. When, you know, cash is, and I said this time and again, is the lifeblood of any business, mm -hmm. just like blood is the is the um, the life-giving product of the body mm -hmm. if you stop the blood flow to the body it's going to die mm -hmm. if you stop the cash to a business at some point in time i don't care how big that business is mm -hmm. even the united states government if there's if the cash flow stops it's going to die mm -hmm. well i mean if you look around and i don't know how much attention you've been able to monitor um you don't see much african-american businesses that can hire a lot of African American people in the in the cities here. I don't know if it's like this. Most likely, like this all over the country, right. that we're losing ground, even though we are gaining grounds, maybe in other areas of the black middle class. But I just want to get the feel that is time running against people that can't get into business and can't get these contracts. Just making their lives of uh, career development worse going into the future if we can't stop this problem and can well, fix it. What happens is they're creating what's known as a tipping point, mm -hmm. okay? And, you know, once you reach a tipping point, uh, you get to systemic failure. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, tax collections in Hartford, if you look at tax collections at the state of Connecticut, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at the amount of services that are required, um, you, you know, within that, uh, given amount of taxes that you collect, okay, mm -hmm. people that are not working are not an asset, they're a liability. Yes, okay. <laughs> they're a liability. So if they can't take care of themselves, either the state, the city, the state, or the federal government has got to take care of them. Mm -hmm. So instead of them paying into the tax coffers, mm -hmm. the money's coming out of the tax coffers from the people that are working Yes. in order to take care of those folks that are not. Mm -hmm. And once you reach that tipping point, uh, what happens is the whole system implodes because the number of people that are employed are insufficient to cover the number of people that are not employed. Okay. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? So the whole system breaks down. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, I'm afraid that, you know, we're headed toward uh, that tipping point. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know when it's going to happen. All I know is it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people, well, doesn't that, uh, doesn't that scare you that, uh, you know, there may be a, a systemic collapse? No, it, it doesn't scare me because that means that, that finally we may get a restart where, you know, people wake up and say, what were we thinking? Having more people not working than working. Mm -hmm. And I'll put this to you. We don't make anything anymore. That's true. <laughs> That's another huge problem. We really, I mean, we don't make anything. So we have dwindling jobs. You know, if I was, uh, you know, if I was a majority, I, I'd probably be trying to do the same thing that they're trying to do in order to maintain my lifestyle, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But um, it, it, at some point, it's going to get to, you look at black and white now, it, it's not going to be black and white. It's going to be, um, you know, rich and poor. Rich and and poor. that's really the, the dividing line. So you get people making, you know, Hundred million, fifty million dollars a year, 
what do they do with that? Mm-hmm. You see, they, they seek, seek out economic inefficiencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they say, uh, well, we can send this job over to China or we can send that used to be done right here in Hartford. Yes. Okay. So you pull that job out of Hartford. What do you replace it with? Mm-hmm. Well, Ruben, that's going to have to be your last word. We just about ran out of time, but I appreciate you covering a lot of ground this I morning did. and giving up your vacation time to be <laughs> a guest a on this, this show. Again, this is Jonathan Small. I enjoyed hosting this program this morning with Rufus Wells as my guest. And as I say every week to people out there in the airwaves, keep the faith and have a very blessed day. Thank you. Thank you.